So why would you want to use FPGAs in HPC at all? The main reason is that compared to CPUs, FPGAs are about 10 to 100 times faster at 20 to 25 watts. The best speed up in relation to, F to standard CPUs uh, is given in all kinds of computation that do not involve floating point. Floating point operations are comparatively less efficient in FPGAs than CPUs, though there is still an absolute performance increase. The performance gap between FPGAs and CPUs is steadily growing, so we can expect that the relative performance is going to be better for FPGAs in the future. Within the HPC space, an FPGA ecosystem has arisen. At the bottom of the ecosystem, we have the basic devices, the CPUs from AMD and Intel, and the FPGAs from Xilinx and Altera. Above that level, we have the system integrators. The FPGA modules themselves that are put into the system uh, come from a number of vendors. For programmability of FPGAs, Mitrionix has the Mitrion Virtual Processor and the Mitrion System Development Kit. And on top of that is where you develop your algorithms as a user. This is a slide of a typical FPGA module. The main point of it is to illustrate the various kinds of bandwidth that you find in an FPGA system. Since FPGAs have so high compute performance, they also require a lot of I.O. or uh, I.O. bandwidth. In this example, <coughs> we have a now slightly aged uh, FPGA model called the Xilinx Vertex 4 LX200. It will have communication on the system bus on 3.2 gigabytes per second in each direction simultaneously. But one important point about the FPGA is that since it's a parallel device, in contrast to classic CPUs, it is capable of a multitude of memory buses. So apart from the system bus communicating with system memory, it also has a number of attached memories that are local to the FPGA only. In this example, we have four attached RAM memories, each one of them having 1.6 gigabytes per second communication in and out. Other possibilities are, of course, also available. The main bandwidth in an FPGA comes from the large number of RAM banks internal to the chip, which can also be configured to what, whatever form is required from the application. In a Vertex 4 LX200, there are 336 512 by 36-bit RAM memories. In total, they will give you about half a terabyte of bandwidth per second. These are a few slides with a quick presentation of how FPGAs actually work. Compared to fixed silicon at the same process technology, the FPGA has some disadvantages. So it has roughly 10 times slower clock frequency and the area used per gate is roughly 50 times larger. So the reconfigurability comes at a cost. However, many times the value of the reconfigurability will outweigh the cost of efficiency. The way an FPGA works is actually quite simple. On the display, you have a regular grid of two kinds of nodes uh, connected in a lattice. The two kinds of nodes are the configurable computing element, or LUT, and a configurable interconnect element that acts like a switching box. The LUT is actually just a lookup table for a simple Boolean operation. In this example, we use four bit LUTs, uh, which aren't used today. Today, larger LUTs are used, but it's a good example which will uh, illustrate the point. To create a circuit in an FPGA, you need to instantiate the gates, that is the logical AND, OR, XOR, and so on operations of the circuit, and you need to connect those gates to each other. The gates themselves 
are implemented in the LUTs or lookup tables. The principle behind a LUT is very, very simple. Essentially, each one of these boxes is a very small RAM memory. It's a RAM memory which has four addresses, four locations for data, and, each, and the word, word size of each address is a single bit. So it's a one bit wide memory with four addresses. This is a very small memory. Such a memory will have two address lines allowing it to access those four different positions and it will have one, data one bit data bus for the data going into the memory or coming out of the memory in the case of a memory read. With such a four bit memory it is possible to put any boolean operation into it. Uh, and you do that as a simple lookup table. So in this example I've now entered um, a 1 at address 3 and zeros in address 2, 1 and address 0. With this configuration the LUT becomes an AND gate because for an AND operation with two false inputs you put those two false inputs onto the address lines and you access address 0. If you had two true values into the AND gate, you put those two true values into the address lines and that will become address 3 where we have stored a 1, making the LUT behave like an AND operation. The other side of an FPGA are the interconnect elements, which are also configurable. These are basically switches which allow any one of the LUTs to be connected to any other one of the LUTs. Together, this enables the formation of any circuit design that you want. So an FPGA is capable of realizing any schematic diagram that you have. It should be noted that once an FPGA is configured, it does behave like the circuit you have de designed in all ways, including the electrical ones. So, for example, if you have designed a short circuit, you would be able to short circuit the FPGA. However, FPGAs have a large number of uh, steps in the configuration process, and many of these have various safeguards, so the probability of actually succeeding in, in uh, short circuiting the FPGA is very low.